Board of Education <coughs> committee the whole meeting to order. Do we have a roll call, please? Mr. Canning? Here. Mrs. Gleason? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mrs. Jones? Here. Mrs. Cameron? Here. Mrs. Ressler? Here. Mrs. Stearns? Here. Please rise for the call. data, uh, processing it, putting it in a form. In the last couple of years, I've done individual meetings with uh, board members. This year, we've decided to do a committee of the whole, so everybody gets the same picture at the same time. A um, couple of things that, that I want to make sure we understand. You're, this is a long presentation, so I apologize up front. It, there's there's a, just a lot to it. Um, so I ask for your patience. Um, I ask that you be open-minded and, and take it all in, because a lot of the questions that you may have along the way, I think will be answered throughout parts of the presentation. This is basically, people need to understand where we've been and the journey we've been on. So every year that I do these individually, we start with where we were, what we've done, how did it work, and what we're gonna do in the future. So we're gonna try to continue that same uh, type of process. You're gonna wanna jump to questions. Your mind just wants, you'll start to race. I find myself doing that all the time. Uh, that's why we left you the uh, sticky notes. If you want to, I would suggest you write your uh, questions on the sticky notes and put it on the page so when we go back and reference it and ask the questions, those questions will be along with the slide. So I think that's a good organizational strategy. Um, you're going to get all the data. The data is going to have some really exciting pieces to it. The data is going to have some pieces where we go, hmm, I wish that data was a little bit better. Oh, this is what we might want to try to do to make that data a little bit better. Um, the other thing, I, I think, again, the more open-minded you are to let that whole thing sink in and, and see the puzzle pieces fit together. What, a, what I hope you take out of tonight is school is a very complex organization. Changing a school is a very complex process. It doesn't happen with the snap of a finger. It, it, we can chart how small changes have taken us years to table. And we're in different phases of change right now. If we had 20 initiatives academically over the last five, six years, they're all in different phases of implementation or evaluation. So there is no on switch and off switch that it all goes on and off together. Does that make sense? Um, the other thing that I want you to really keep in your mind is averages and data can play tricks on you. Okay, so when you see a number and the number is an average, that average may be the average that's in the middle, but it may be the average that's in the middle because it's compared to something that's extremely high and something that's extremely low. So you don't hit the average because everybody's right around that number. You hit the average because you combine a very high part of the organization or a very high number with a very low number. And you're gonna see that, um, especially in the state of Illinois. You're gonna see a state average, <coughs> But there's very few schools that really look like the state average. The schools look like incredibly wealthy and incredibly poor. 
you take incredibly wealthy and incredibly poor, you put them together and you come up with an average. So I don't want us to think that that average is where we're expected to be. It's a number, okay? We in our organization look at improvement. We look at growth. We look at tweaking systems that have been in place for 20, 10, five, three, one year um, to, to change and improve the organization. So with that, I think I've talked enough. We'll turn it over to Corey. Again, save your questions. I'm gonna jump in and we're gonna kind of tag team this. We haven't really rehearsed it down to the minute, so forgive me if I step out of the words a little bit. All right, go ready to go. 144 slides, you're up. All right, well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Dr. Kendall mentioned, uh, in the first tab of your binder is the actual PowerPoint. So as we're going slide by slide, if you want to, with your post-it notes, that's that way you remember if you have a specific question on that slide, just throw it right on that, um, that copy, okay? And then we'll be referencing um, some of the research as we go throughout, okay? Uh, principals and central office staff, you also have a copy of the presentation. Um, your slides go left to right. All right, so um, Dr. Kendall already gave the opening remarks. We're going to look at the history of No Child Left Behind because it's played a significant impact on all of the school districts in the state of Illinois. Where we are with the current testing status, um, our movement towards multiple measures, understanding our overarching um, understandings and goals and areas of focus. We're going to look at our multiple measures that we have been implementing for the last six, seven years. And then what we're focusing on this year for so let's take a, a road back, a trip back in time, if you will, in the history of the NCLB. PSAE began in 2001. So PSAE is the Prairie State Achievement Exam. Prior to 2001, there was no accountability system for schools. Okay. How schools did and what they thought of achievement was more of a feel-good thing, as opposed to actual data that was reported. Okay. It was based on perception or a feel. So if you had a good experience in your school, you believed that your school was a good school. Um, were there numbers to back it up other than your grades? Not really. In 2003, the state of Illinois was required because they received federal funding to identify these Eagle Step models to ensure that by 2014, 100% of the students met or exceeded on the Prairie State Achievement Exam. What, what, first time it's been done. One thing that, that we want to keep in mind, well, actually, it's two things. One, there's a lot of money in play. So there's federal dollars that the state's trying to get, and then there's state dollars that the local school districts are going to get. So you're going to see, as this is weaved together, some political reasoning behind it. And the other piece, frankly, there's money. There's a money piece in all of this linear strategy that says we're going to judge schools. There's a money piece tied to it. So in 2003, when this model was put into place, the target was 40%. 40% of your students had to meet or exceed in reading and math. You had to hit an attendance rate of 88%. And the graduation rate was only 65%. Just, just to kind of refresh your memory, PSAE was made up of, it was a two-day test, it was ACT on day one, and then work keys on day two. And work keys is also a product of ACT. For the first few years when PSAE was implemented, District 228 um, chose to focus on test prep strategies to help familiarize students with the ACT, with work keys. Okay, so for the first few years, we were just helping kids kind of figure out how to tackle the test. But we felt that afterwards, we wanted to embed ACT-like questions and ACT-like strategies into our core curriculum. So we spent a lot of time focusing on uh, bell ringers in mathematics. In science, we broke the ACT into different grade levels. For example, in the freshman year, we really hit data uh, charts and graphs really hard. In the sophomore year, where they were doing more experiments, we focused on research summaries. And then in biology, we focused on the junior year uh, conflicting viewpoints, which are three parts of the ACT. Two, so, what? two points I want to make here. 2003 was the first time where 
they ever put a label on a school as a failing school. So all the time before that, again, it was feel. Um, they put numbers to it and said, this school's failing, this school is not failing. So that was the first time in 2003. And I, I think it's really significant to look at those test prep strategies. It was chasing a number. It was, what can we do to get the number to make sure we're not a failing school? That was the goal. That was where people's mindset was at the time. And it was an appropriate mindset for what we knew when we knew it. Okay? Not necessarily the best way to do school, but it's what we did at the time. And we weren't the only ones. Districts across the state were doing the same thing. Get that number. So you don't fail. So this is what the equal step model looked like again. Beginning in 2003, the target was 45, 40%, 40 the graduation rate was 65%. It was supposed to go up 7.5%. You'll notice there were a couple years where the target stayed the same, then it went up 7.5, 7.5, 7.5, all the way through to equal and then 100% in 2014. The attendance rate also um, had to be met. So in order for a school and or a district to meet adequate yearly progress, Students had to meet or exceed the targeted reading and math. They also had to meet the uh, graduation rate of the year, and 95% of the students had to be tested. So not only did all students have to meet that parameter, but every subgroup of student also had to meet those parameters in order for a school to meet adequate yearly progress. There's, an, there's a significant assumption here. The assumption is that your subjects remain the same. Your subjects meaning your students. So when they said in 2004 that 40% was the target, in 2005 it went up 7.5% and your subjects changed 100%. Those are completely different students. So when you, when you talk about growth, we talk about growth from student A through his career. No child left behind compared this group to this group and expected growth. From 2003 to 2011, only students beginning the junior year with 12 credits were tested. And this was done intentionally. So I'm going to refer you to um, the first exhibit, which is Exhibit A, the benefits of the high school core curriculum. For a student to be successful on the ACT, ACT recommends a core curriculum. That means four years of English, three years of math, three years of science, and three years of social studies. And it's not just any course. In math, for example, they say a student needs algebra one, algebra two, and geometry, that's the core. In science, it's biology, it's chemistry, and physics, that's the core. Anything less than that, a student would not necessarily meet the benchmark that ACT is setting. Okay. Another problem with this ACT, the ACT model is a high school model. So all the research that ACT provides assumes that you start high school prepared for the ninth grade level. The, the research is really somewhat silent and it comes in later when they're starting to wrap their mind around it, um, that what do you do with the students who are underperforming? Uh, and what we used to do when people, perceptions dictated whether we were successful, we created courses that our kids could get good grades in. Um, I believe we had three courses below algebra one. So in 2000 and earlier, kids could take three years of math and not get a high school math credit. <clears throat> so it felt good. They're doing well in school. When they leave us, they were absolutely unprepared. So one of our first challenges was accepting a group of students who's not really prepared for the core curriculum and get them in a core curriculum and wrap around supports, which is, I believe, challenging, incredibly challenging, but the best way to service our students. So during this whole time frame, as I can kind of look into, <coughs> is we were also focusing on eliminating our remedial courses where we could and gradually phasing them out but then also continuing to push our higher students by opening up AP opportunities and honors opportunities for our students. 
All students were given the opportunity to take the PSE. In fact, it was a, it's a graduate at the time. It was a graduation requirement. So if they didn't have enough credits in their junior year, they did sit in their senior year to take the ACT. Again, having another year of the curriculum under the belt would provide them an opportunity of being more successful on the ACT. From 2011 to 2014, however, the state changed how they calculated the scores and all student scores counted. So any student that sat in a given testing year, whether they were a junior or a senior, counted. In the last two years of testing, remember that um, the graduation rate was set at 85% and attendance rate at 92%. So what the state needed to do in order to access federal funds was prove that they had a rigorous curriculum. So proving that they had a rigorous, rigorous curriculum, they noticed that schools were maybe playing the system, depending on who you ask, or maybe doing what's right for the student, giving them in the best place to take the ACT. Depends on what side of the accountability fence you're on. I'd like to think that we felt good about giving our students an extra year of math, giving them a better opportunity to take the ACT, so when they go on to college or go on to a junior college, they have a better test score to go with them, okay? But the state, in their ability, their desire to chase federal dollars, wanted to prove that we were rigorous and started to, in essence, prove that schools are failing. Because when you raise the bar, people fall under it. One thing we forgot to mention, um, in 2012, when this threshold started um, going above 90%, only 11 high schools in the state of Illinois actually met AYP in 2012. I think 11. there's 650, 660 high schools in the state of Illinois. So if 11, and if you looked at the schools, it was definitely socioeconomically uh, driven. There were 11, and I believe those all fell somewhere. Yeah, well, in 2014, 13. there were only two schools, and they were magnet schools that met AYP. Okay, so when we take a look at the history of PSAE for District 228 and the state of Illinois, so your blue is the target, starting out at 40%, and it's an upward climb all the way to 100%. And this is where Dr. Kendall kind of alluded to. You want to take you don't want to isolate a data point in a specific period of time. You want to look at a trend. And what is the trend telling you? Even in the state of Illinois, you don't see a lot of growth across the state. The state of Illinois didn't even hit the target. And you'll see fluctuations in our own population. Again, when you compare a, a group of students to themselves, where we see lifts, we had stronger students that year. Um, it was funny I asked that question of Corey this morning. Uh, what happened in 2006, and she named the students right off. She named about six of them, and she knew the whole class was a high-flying group. So that comparison in of itself is because of, of the students. Did we talk about purpose of ACT? No, we did not. Is that Sure. You didn't? Sure. Okay. Remember, we talked about money playing a big part of this. If you go down to Springfield and look at the Illinois State Board, uh, Board of Education offices, they're all empty. And this has been going on for probably, probably not since 2001, but in the last seven or eight years, they've drastically reduced their staff uh, because of money. To develop a test that would be appropriate that you could get the entire state from Southern Illinois to Evanston to agree on was virtually impossible and ridiculously expensive. So they went and said, ACT, well, actually, they went to the federal government and said, can we get money if we use the ACT? The federal government came back and said, yeah, that's appropriate. Um, last year, 13, school, 13 states used the ACT as their model. There's a problem with the model. The ACT is set up to determine a student's success rate in the first semester of college. And Corey will get to some of those numbers later. So 
how will a student do the first year of college? And they nationally norm that test and they adjust that test because they know in college there's some students that are going to be successful, some students that are not. There is no no child left behind in college. College is a very competitive atmosphere. So we took a test that was designed to sort and separate and regulate who goes to college and who's successful in college, and we made that test determine success or failure on a high school level. So you would expect, because the test is set up for the uh, results to be flat, okay, it was a, an easy way to get the money uh, from the federal government. So again, remember when you're looking at the data points, what we talked about right here in 2011, that's when all the scores started counting, regardless of um, the grade level. So that's why you're going to see that dip. But in reading in particular, we were starting on an upwards trend again. The other piece that I forgot to mention, across the country, with the exception of the 13 states that use it to determine whether schools are successful, students who intend to go to college take the ACT. If you have no desire to go to college, you don't have to take the ACT. You, there's no reason for you to take the ACT. So when you compare states that use the ACT to determine success with the states that selectively college-bound students take, those numbers are different. So if you're looking at from here back, basically our students who were planning on going to college were taking the ACT. They were flourishing in school and those are the ones we reported. From here forward, it's every student taking the ACT. And that includes special ed students <coughs> and English language learners. All students had to take the ACT unless they had specific uh, IEPs that, that they took a different test. In math, um, again, you'll see the state pretty much flatlined in math, so the state didn't even hit their, uh, hit their targets. You see that dip again in 2011 when all scores um, were counted. So that's kind of the history of PSAE. Um, that test no longer exists. Now we're operating under a new system. It took us 14 years to go. Eh, that may be that not may be the best way to go about this. So here's what we know in terms of the current <coughs> testing status. We know Park replaced the PSAE. I think it's really clear now. Yeah. And the scores will be lower. You have two exhibits in section B of your tab. The first one is an article from the Chicago Tribune that is actually um, an extension of the second exhibit, which is exhibit B1. It's an email to uh, school districts from Dr. Tony Smith, the state superintendent, basically warning schools and also communities to understand the results of the park assessments, they are going to be lower than ACT. The students that were proficient under ACT are not necessarily going to be proficient under park. In fact, the preliminary results are out right now, just the uh, online scores, not the paper and pencil scores. 17% of the students in the state of Illinois met on the park. There's two points that I want to make. One, Dr. Smith, um, emphatically refers to not having a test judge the success or failure of a school. Uh, it's a piece of a much larger picture. The other thing that I found interesting, it wasn't in this email, but in a different email, there's a huge political organizational movement to get schools away from park. Um, and Dr. Smith, basically in his email said, we're gonna stick with it because we have a contract for two years. So I kind of inferred that he doesn't know where we're gonna be after two years. Um, where's the money gonna be? We, uh, the state uh, negotiated a contract with Pearson to provide property. a three-year contract with two years left. I would not be surprised if political ramifications do something to park. There's a lot of money spent statewide uh, for park. And it also put ACT in question. Uh, the other part of that is, in the past, last year, 
the state uh, subsidized schools to take the ACT, even though they weren't going to use it, at between $55 and $85 per student. ACT still exists. It's still a viable test to measure students and give them a chance to go to college. However, the state's not paying for it anymore, so it's a decision that we're struggling. Do we believe it's right for our students? We believe it would be. The other thing that's unique with data, if we only pay for the tests of the students that want to go to college, we would probably drop the number of students taking the test by 40 to 60 percent, and guess what? Our schools get better just because of the students that are tested. It's nothing that we've done, but the perception would be because of those numbers the school got better. So all these data points, um, I tend to use the cynical side of my brain, um, it, it, could be, it could be wrong. So Dr. Smith also alludes to in his email that, as Dr. Hill mentioned, we're not going to rely on one data point to judge a school. We're going to look at other measures. But he doesn't define what those measures are. We know that the nation values ACT. We know accountability is required by law. Multiple measures will have a role. Um, and the use, the use of AT, ACT's college and career readiness benchmarks right now are unaligned. And I'm going to show you um, a little bit later what I mean. What the state is reporting on ISBE is not what ACT uses as college readiness benchmarks. Um, and as Dr. Ken alluded to, all this may change based on funding and politics. Right now, part is in, but three years from now, we don't know. So one thing, you're going to hear the term multiple measures over and over. Um, that's going to be a number of different data points that are going to measure whether a school is successful or not, as opposed to that one test. So in my mind, it's it's a good thing. It's a, it's a more fair look at our schools. What no one knows, we don't know what the park measure will mean. What uh, has been alluded to is there's going to be six levels of performance. They haven't set right now what level will be meet or exceeds. Um, so we don't know what that looks like. We know it's going to be bad. Yeah, we already know it's going to be bad. The future of ACT is still undecided. So Exhibit C is an article from the TRIP. Um, it's a budget turmoil leaves the ACT for juniors in limbo. Um, it was slated to be paid for by the state. The state still has not made a decision. We have registered to provide the test for the students. But if the state doesn't pay for it, we don't know what we're going to do. It's, it, it's going to be a $50,000, $60,000 investment if that's something we want to give all of our students. They're working on a budget since July. So we don't know. We don't know what the state is doing with the park results in terms of how is this going to be um, held, how are we going to be held accountable to those pieces. Um, and the state's use of multiple measures right now is not defined. So that leaves school districts kind of on their own to measure indicators within their own systems. So that brings us to the creation of our multiple measures. Exhibit D, you have two um, items in there, and these are just a quick snapshot of the covers. This on the left is the old Illinois report card. Um, on the right is our development of the multiple measures report card that we began in 2011. So prior to 2011, we started getting some hints from the state that they were moving towards a new report card. We didn't know what that looked like, but we had some general ideas of it's going to be more than just test scores and financials. Um, so we put um, together the one on the right. So the old is the model focused on demographics, educator data, financial data, and performance data. That was it. We started looking at other areas of achievement, not only academic achievement, college and career readiness. We also looked at the learning environment, anything related to discipline, how are we doing with suspensions, referrals, attendance, things of that nature. And we created this new report card, which you have an example um, from 2011. These were kind of a preview of the new report card that you see on the website, the Illinois Interactive Report Card. So if you uh, were to Google IllinoisReportCard.com, that is uh, the newest version of the state report card. I, I think it, it's interesting to know, if you look at the uh, data that was measured, there's most of it we don't control. We don't control our demographics. We don't control our educator data because we hire them and then they they gain their um, 
master's degrees and things like that. Finances is certainly dictated by the federal government, the state government, and the local government. And the PSAE data, which is linked to the ACT, which is predetermined when you come in the door. So there's not a lot of control there. But we started talking about lining up our multiple measures with things that we can measure improvement on, things that we can commit to as our goals and move to improve. So we came up with academic achievement in, in a number of different varieties. College and career readiness, we define differently than what the state defines college and career readiness. College and career readiness defined by the state is a test score. Um, we've evolved from that a little bit. The learning environment, how is our school safety-wise, and the other thing we focused on, our students will not learn if they're not in the classroom. They have to be with their teachers. So what can we do as a system to make sure our students are where they belong with their teachers? During this time, we also wanted to focus on what is our end goal? What are our enduring understanding? So um, if this we were um, starting to focus on improvement and looking at it in terms of how we also write curriculum and how we approach um, the classroom. And we use a structure called understanding by design. And that means you always begin with the end in mind and work backwards. And so part of our curriculum writing and our lesson plan writing, we always have these things called enduring understanding. So what do we want our students to remember 10 years from now about whatever it is that we're teaching? Same concept you can apply to them at the district level. What do we want our stakeholders to remember, our, our staff, our community, our students, 10 years from now? And so we have four overarching enduring understandings. We agree that all students can learn. First and foremost, every decision we make is about students. We believe every student, no matter what color, what gender, what baggage you bring to school, we believe all students can learn. And, and, and that's, a, that's an incredibly huge shift for our organization. Because you got to remember, a couple years before that, we were only testing people who we deemed worthy of taking the test. We only put students in classes that prepare them for college that we believe were worthy by a test. So you could come in, take a placement test as an eighth grader, and that would determine whether you're going to be successful in college based on the courses that we put you in. If you fail that test, you're starting in transitions to the introduction to semi-academic pre-algebra with that up. But that's where we were. So we were virtually, excuse my French, damning students based on a test. Shifting to, we take our students, whoever they are, where they are and push them and help them and support them so when they leave us they have the best opportunity they have to be a success in life no matter what the test score says okay and, and i compare this and i've talked about this a hundred times and some people are going to be bored by it i coached and coached a team that won a state championship and I thought I was the greatest coach in America because we won a state championship. The very next year, I left and went to a different school district and went 0-9 and, and realized when I went 0-9 and the next year, I worked 10 times harder than I did the previous year when we won the state title. Okay? You work hard, but the commitment to taking the students that you have from wherever they are and getting them to have a great experience is what we're all about. All that other stuff, okay, it's out there, but it's not what we hang our hats on. Our second enduring understanding is we agree that students learn in different ways and in a variety of strengths and weaknesses. So again, no matter what you're coming into school with, and it's the same thing with adults. All of, all of us in this room have specific strengths. We have also some areas where, you know, I wish that was a little bit better. Um, and the same thing in, in all your subject areas. You know, some kids absolutely excel in science, they're usually not very good in English and social studies. It's usually science and math, English and social studies. Some students are absolutely excel in the fine arts, but struggle in academic areas. Same that we, we recognize that, and we have to find opportunities to differentiate. We accept you for who you are. We never 
we're never going to do anything systemically to deem you a failure as a student or as a school. We recognize that most of our students are achieving an acceptable rate and we believe that these same students can do better. And we also recognize that there are a number of students who are not achieving an acceptable rate and we firmly believe that they can do better as well. And these uh, four enduring understandings were adopted by the board in 2009. In an acceptable rate in bullet three, we had kids that were doing wonderful things. They liked school, they were getting good grades in school, and they were leaving us without an opportunity for college credit. They walked out the door without the opportunity for college credit. Okay? They just existed here, melded right into the system, did wonderful things. We loved them, we congratulated them, and we sent them away. The opportunity for them to get college credit was something that we had to commit to and push. Um, and we did that successfully. So from there, that leads us to our overarching goal. Our overarching goal is students will be college and career ready by the time they graduate. For whatever that means to the individual. Whether they're going to be four-year college bound, two-year college bound, trade school, go into the military, go into the workforce, uh, what have you. We want to make sure that we have opportunities for all of our students. And you're going to... You've been hearing over the course of the last couple of years certifications. You've been hearing students in work programs, our partnerships with the community, because the motivation for us is simply, when you leave us, will you be okay? When you leave us, will you have a chance? And it's not a number, because I could care less about the numbers. I care about the chance and the opportunity you have when you leave us. So to help us achieve that goal, we have three major areas of focus, academic achievement, college and career development, and the learning environment. And in each of those areas, we have key indicators, and these are just some. These are some of the major ones, but there's other minor key indicators that we look at. And we monitor these throughout the entire year. We have quarterly data retreats, and all administrators are responsible for pulling different pieces of um, the data as it relates to their level in the organization. We share that data at team meetings, it's parts, and again, what's applicable is shared with faculty at faculty meetings, at school improvement days, into days, department meetings, wherever those data pieces align in the organization. So we're constantly looking at data. Data drives what we do, it drives our decisions, it drives our focus. If you think about the shift, the, the best place that I can highlight the shift in the organization is in learning environments. In learning environment, it was standard practice. If you did not follow our rules, and you did not behave accordingly, we would expel you, suspend you, get you away from your teacher, because we were going to teach you that you were gonna behave and it's my way or the highway. It didn't work, it didn't work. All we did was take students away from the very people that they needed to foster their education. It made people uncomfortable. Okay, you got to remember, we asked you to take students that who may or may not be prepared and put them in tougher classes. And then we challenged you to say, you're not coming out of your classes. You're in there to learn. We're going to do everything in our power to help them learn. An exhausting, overwhelming challenge for the organization. Um, the numbers will show this. We're having success there. So with all these areas of focus and all these key indicators, that brings us to the need for multiple measures. We don't want to just look at student achievement alone in isolation. It is a piece of this larger puzzle. So looking at student achievement alone is not sufficient in terms of understanding comprehensive school improvement. We have two exhibits. Um, exhibit E is a multiple measures. It's an article from Dr. Uh, Victoria Bernhardt who works on uh, data analysis for school improvement, and that's her uh, spheres of data in the right hand corner. And also in Exhibit F, you have the condition of college and career readiness, which is from ACT. ACT is also coming out and saying, hey, stop using our number as the only indicator of student success. There are other things that you need to know about your kids that will help identify them if they're college and career ready. So ACT is even coming out and saying, you need to be looking at multiple measures. Okay. And we're going to, we need to start looking at four domains, and we've already been doing this. Demographics, we report on that every year. Perceptions, 
is uh, a new piece that's kind of coming into play in terms of surveys, Illinois Five Essential surveys and, and other survey tools that are out there. What's happening in student learning, which is your achievement, and then school processes. What things do we have in place that are helping or hindering student achievement? Okay. Well, one thing that you'll notice as we go through the data, the data is all in isolation right now. So we haven't put the pieces of data together because we just don't have the time or the manpower to do that. Last board meeting, uh, you approved decision ed, and what decision ed will do for us is take all four of these, link them together, and determine academic success based on a blend of all of them instead of each one in isolation. So therefore, we can look at four different items determine what we want to look at and measure the improvement. So we believe we can narrow down our focus. I know, Kim, at the board meeting you were wondering how is this going to improve academic achievement? We believe that when we get a clearer understanding of all the data points together, we can be more precise in what we're trying to do to move the education forward. And also on a side note, um, Mr. Canning, you had asked how many schools in the state of Illinois had decision ed. I actually had an email from Michelle last night because she actually watched the board meeting from last week. When I quoted five, I was misquoted. As of last week, we are actually the 10th school in Illinois that just signed on. So five more schools have signed on since we started looking at decision ed in Illinois. So sure to, to answer this very question. That yeah. we, we more and more schools are recognized and the, and the state is moving in this direction. We need to be looking at multiple measures. Um, the Center for School Improvement, so this is a um, organization that's funded through the state of Illinois that works with priority school districts. Um, they actually slipped us this um, data piece and it's Exhibit G in your uh, binder. It is now out for public information. This is, we believe, although they haven't said explicitly, this is kind of where the state is headed in terms of multiple measures. And you'll notice it's also looking at the four domains, student learning data, processes, demographic, and perception. So we're well on our way to start looking at many of the measures that the state um, is doing, and, and a lot of these we're already doing already. We've been doing for six, seven years. There are some new data points that we may want to consider, hey, that's an interesting piece. We haven't looked at that before. And there's some items on that list that frankly, we may not want to look at at all. Yeah. One thing when you look at those, those are simply examples. They're not going to dictate that these are the exact ones that we're going to use, but these are examples of data points that you can use. The other thing I will tell you, and I use this as uh, a guiding document for our opening day for administrators, and there wasn't a lot of reaction. There wasn't a lot of outrage and fear. It was, yeah, that's cool. We do that all the time. That's natural. I guarantee if you take this to a bunch of school districts who are not measuring multiple measures, they're going to freak out. And we're so there. I mentioned some of these um, items that we're going to start going through and looking at may become part of our projects and part of our data retreat. So if you will, in Appendix H, we're going to take a, a mental pause right here and give you an opportunity to look at our project list. You have. Um, going back to 2008 and 2009, this is what we've been working on for the last six, seven years. So we'll ask that you take a couple of minutes just to peruse each Where of the scores. It's Appendix H, as in Henry. And I think it illustrates that school improvement is simply not a switch. It's a complex animal.
by no means do I need to infer that that's a perfect list and all that stuff is, it was a great idea at the time and it worked and we didn't move away from it because we realized that that may not be the road we want to go down. So um, it was what we were working on at that time. We learned every, every year a little bit more. is 
significant for our district. Um, and it's something that we need to understand not only as a system but also down to the classroom level with the teacher because um, students from families of low income have challenges. They have their, in some cases, many cases, the family's in crisis. So the students are, in, in some cases, you know, they come from single parent homes. They may actually, especially if they're older, go to work to help support the family. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration. We also know, and the research shows us, that students that come from low income families don't necessarily have the same experiences as students from affluent families. You know, they haven't been taken to the museum. They haven't been out of their communities. Maybe they haven't even gone to the grocery store. I know when I was in the classroom teaching plant science, I will never forget the very first year I did my fruit lab with the students, and I made a fruit salad for them, and most of my students have never had a raspberry. They had no idea what a blueberry was. I mean, these are common things that we take for granted. Um, and those are experiences because of their family situation. They may not have had the opportunity to, to have that type of food. What, what does low income it's defined as $24,000 less or less as an entire family. A year. A year. Family income. $24,000 less. 24000 total income for the family. So now you take that number, and that has to be reported. They, they come in, they have a meeting with our associate principal, lay their documents on the table, and we verify whether that's appropriate or not, because we have to send that off to get some federal funding, some state funding to support that. So if we're at 43.8%, that's 43.8% of the people that came and shared that information with us. There's another layer that's at 25, 26, 27,000, or simply too embarrassed to admit they're in the situation that they're in so I would assume those numbers are higher for us we accept our students who they are where they are and we put them in the pe best possible position uh, if you look at Hillcrest uh, low income six out of ten students are in some sort of financial situation that's a challenge uh, and, and I don't want you to think that I'm giving you these numbers as an excuse. It's simply a challenge that we readily accept. And this does play a role in academic achievement. Annual family income, and this is directly related to ACT scores. Exhibit I is um, the ACT College Readiness Benchmark Attainment by Annual Family Income. 24% of students from families with incomes between 50 and 60,000 met all four college readiness benchmarks and are considered college and career ready. Only 24%. 9% of students from family incomes of less than 24,000 met all four benchmarks. So if we take that number and translate that into District 228, we have about 5,100 students. 40% of that is about 2,040 students. 9% of that, we can expect only 184 of our students to be, to be college and career ready according to ACT benchmarks. And those are national numbers. So um, it, it's not an excuse. So I guess one of the things I'm most proud of with our faculty and with our administrative team, 18% increase over seven years and our academic performance is stable or growing. That's an incredible statistic. On the flip side, students from family incomes between 120,000 and 150,000 are twice as likely to meet college and um, career readiness benchmarks, according to ACT. Okay, so going back to what Dr. Kendall talked about earlier in terms of averages, in the state of Illinois, we have school districts that are highly affluent, and we have school districts that are severely poor, and that's where your averages um, you know, being misleading. That number does not make sense to a student. No. He doesn't care about those others. He just is worried about having an opportunity someday in his life. Absolutely. The good news is, though, we don't want to, you know, have this all be doom and gloom. Low-income students can increase their levels of achievement by completing core curriculum. So we go back to we have to start continuing, or not start, we need to continue pushing our students, supporting them in core curriculum. 
intervening, and that's where we constantly look at the data and see which of our kids are in crisis, which of our kids are at risk, we need to intervene. Um, and again, provide them as many opportunities for whatever their path is when they leave us. Um, and you also have uh, the state speaks to family income and completion rate of the poor group. So we wanted to kind of talk a moment about the impact of low income because it is something that we're dealing with and it continues to rise in our district. So we have to be aware of that, but if we're not going to let that be an excuse. We want to make sure that all our kids are prepared. In terms of our limited English proficiency, these are our students with um, English as a second language. We've been pretty much right around 1.5% in the district. Of course, you'll see um, higher numbers there because that's where the um, ESL program is housed. Our IEP enrollment is on average about 15%. And then here are our demographics um, by ethnicity. <coughs> right around 36% white students for the district. about 39% black as a district average. Obviously, Hillcrest is mostly African-American, so they're in that like a higher percentage. And then our Hispanic student population is right around 20%. Ethnicity, we're, we're pretty stable. The significant change is that low income. I'm not going to dwell too long on this. I already kind of highlighted it in the beginning, and plus, the PSA is no longer given. But at the time, this was reported by the Assistant Principals for Teaching and Learning. It's a measure of achievement of, grade, of students in grade 11. It was comparing one class to another, so we were not comparing cohorts of students, meaning the same students. As I mentioned, it was made up of the ACC and the work keys. It was on a scale of 1 to 36. In four content areas, English, math, um, reading, and science, there was a writing prompt, um, and then the work keys was the um, application of knowledge in day two. This is our um, Prairie State Achievement Exam math meets or exceeds from 2007 forward. Remember, when we look at this dip, this is where seniors started counting in terms of um, making the adequate yearly progress. Our reading, we started to see an upwards trend in reading before the test went away. So like I said, I don't want to dwell, we've already kind of covered that piece. I do want to spend some time, though, talking about ePass. And ePass is a product, it's Educational Planning Assessment System, that is a product of ACT, and it has three tests. Explore, which is given at 8th grade. It was our old 8th grade placement test. There's also a ninth grade Explore that's given in the fall. 10th grade Plan, which is given in the fall. And then it's, they're all precursors to the ACT. So they're all benchmark assessments that allow us to predict how our students um, will do on the ACT and also get a gauge of where they are. Let's take a moment and talk about though the ACT benchmarks because um, this is what the state is using right now. College and career readiness, they're using the ACT benchmark. So let's take a look at what they actually mean. The benchmark is a predictor of first year college success, and that's all it is. It predicts whether or not a student will earn a B or a C. If a student meets a benchmark, let's say in math, they have a 50% chance of getting a B in college algebra. So according to the state of Illinois, this student is a success, and if he is a success, his opportunity of getting a B is a flip of a coin. That. Exhibit K in your binder actually has all the benchmarks for all tests, all four areas. Students who met readiness benchmarks in eighth grade showed the most growth from Explore to ACT. So if they're meeting the benchmarks coming into high school, they will usually be on track and they will show the most growth to the ACT. Which means a flippable coin of getting a B in the college. Right. That's it. Students who met in eighth grade also stayed on track, 
And the results also hold true for minority students. If my, all, the, all the demographics, if all demographics hit the benchmark in eighth grade, they will stay on track and they will hit their benchmark on the ACT. Here's the interesting point. Students who are significantly off target, meaning they're two points or more off of the benchmark, are less likely to become college ready during their time in high school, meaning that they'll hit the benchmark. If they're two points off the benchmark coming into high school, they are less likely to hit the ACT benchmark by the time they're a junior. This requires schools to intervene, remediate, tutor, do some extra things to help them close that gap in order to meet that benchmark. They may never meet the benchmark. The goal is to close that gap and get them the highest ACT score possible. And this is exhibit um, A, going back to the benefits of a high school core curriculum, and exhibit L, how much growth is actually reasonable in high school. This is another piece of research in your mind. This is research based on, I believe, last year, 1.5 million students took the ACT. So in the world of research, the higher your number, the better your research is, you're not going to find a, a bigger set than 1.5 million. Let's take a look at, um, internally, the impact of the core curriculum. So as I mentioned, um, ACT says in math, students need Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry to meet the college readiness benchmark as a junior. Students who take more advanced work, so if our kids are coming in already taking Honors Geometry as a freshman or Honors Algebra 2, and they're getting to pre-calc and calculus plus you as a junior, their ACT scores will be even higher. So if we look at our curriculum right now, if a student is in any one of these courses, that's considered the core. If they're starting in pre-algebra and going to algebra for upper or topics in geometry, this is old because we, we are, again, this is a lower level math that we've removed. But if they were on this bottom path, they were not taking the core curriculum according to ACT. Here's the other thing to remember. Prior to 2001, when we were a succeeding school district, the majority of our students were in non-core classes. So what does this look like in terms of figures? If we actually look, this is the current, the graduating class of 2015. These are the Explorer scores. So when they took the Explorer in the fall of ninth grade, we did not really instruct them. So this is pretty much based on eighth grade knowledge. These are the scores core, compared to the non-core. When they took the plan as a sophomore, core versus the non-core, and ACT as a junior, core is the non-core. The benchmark for math, they say a student must come into high school scoring an 18 on the Explorer. We weren't even hitting the benchmark as freshmen. Again, remember, these are averages. As a, and the plan, they should be getting a 19, and on the ACT, they should be getting a 22. So according to ACT, there's a large number for us on average. Our students don't have a chance of being a success if we accept this to be the premise of our district. That's why we define college and career ready as are you prepared for your opportunity when you leave us? A much different um, mindset. But if you look at the cohort of students, so if we just take Remnant as an example, if they came in at a 10.8, if you look at them over time, they're actually showing growth. And they're showing improvement. So our curriculum is working, our interventions are working. Can we do more? Absolutely. But all of our students are still showing growth. They just come in at different points. And as I talked about earlier, take our students wherever they are and push them and support them as best we can. And don't worry about anything else. ACT has actually updated the benchmarks. And they are doing this frequently. The first set of benchmarks that they set back in 2005 was based on cohorts of students between 1995 and 2002. So if we go back in time to the beginning of the presentation, remember PSAE started in 2001. All students in the state of Illinois had to take the ACT. Prior to that, it was only college-bound students that took the ACT. So those benchmarks were based on kids that were going to college. Right. Their recent study in 2013, and this is Exhibit M in your binder, uh, used cohorts from 2005 and later. And based upon their study, they've actually adjusted the benchmarks. 
Um, but keep in mind, these are always going to be subject to change because they're based on college grading standards, student performance in college classes, and the alignment of curriculum between high school and post-secondary institutions. So these could always be in flux as performance changes. And remember, from a college point of view, the ACT is a tool to separate successful students from unsuccessful students. They want the successful students for their own reasons. So this is the result of their study. And it really only impacted reading and science. English and math standards remained the same based upon their study. But all of the reading benchmarks went up. So now students have to have a 17 when they enter high school and get a 22 on the ACT. Again, to have a probability of getting a B in English composition as a freshman, a 50% chance. And the science uh, benchmarks actually went down. And the reason they went down is their study, um, their study is based on first year college students. Well, the majority of freshmen who take biology are biology majors. They're not your average student. So those students have uh, an affinity towards that subject. That's what they want to do. That's what they excel in. So their ACT score is going to be higher. So they actually lowered the benchmark for science. So those are the new college readiness benchmarks. So who uses these benchmarks? And ACT actually talks about the purpose of these benchmarks and what you should be doing with them. Post-secondary schools use them for these items. How many kids are actually going to enroll in post-secondary college and university? What likelihood of success are they going to have? What's their first year GPA? What's their GPA in their, their uh, major? And then are they going to graduate timely or are they going to be lingering for six, seven years? That's what post-secondary institutions use the benchmarks for. ACT also talks about what should we be using them for locally, K-12. We want to monitor academic progress. Again, very few students who are far off the benchmark will be college and career ready by the time that they're juniors. What we need to start moving toward is not if they're, um, sorry, not if they're ready or not, but let's look at it in terms of probabilities. And let me give you an example. Remember, for math, the benchmark is a 22, which means you have a 50% chance of getting a B in college algebra. But if a student gets a 15, they have a 19% chance of getting a B or better. If I get a 25, I have a 64% chance of getting a B or better. Okay, so we have to look at it in terms of probability of success, not whether or not you're ready. And look at it from a school standpoint, the difference between a 22 and a 20 is the difference between a success and a failure, if we accept the notion of failure, and the only difference is a 39% to a 50% on being successful in high school, or in college. Right. So one point off the benchmark, if I get a 21 in my math score, I don't get counted as meeting the benchmark, but all that's saying is I have a 49% chance of getting a B. Doesn't mean I'm not college and career ready. So benchmark attainment rates do not vary from year to year. This is uh, 2011 to 2015 nationally um, uh, scored tests. You have your subject areas here and the gray is hard to see. This bottom row is the percentage of students that met all four college readiness benchmarks as a nation. The class of 2015, only 28% of the students in the entire country actually hit all four benchmarks. And you can see they're pretty much flat, 64, 65% here. You'll see, remember that the benchmarks changed in 2013 for reading and science, so reading went up. I'm sorry, reading went down and science went up because the benchmarks changed. Otherwise, it's pretty consistent year to year in terms of how our students do nationally. And the purpose is to remain flat, to sort of separate at the college level. Right. So benchmark attainment, again, is not related to your probability of success in your first year of college. And that's, so that's why I talk about any kid that did not meet the benchmark, we get counted as zero. all four subjects, 64% of the students in the class of 2015 met in English, 46% in reading, 42% in math, 38% in science, 28% overall. 
you'll see ourselves compared to the nation, compared to the state. 13% of the graduates of 2015 met all four benchmarks. On the state level, 26%. Okay, so here's where I talked about in the beginning where the use of college and career readiness is unaligned. The state is actually using 21 as their indicator and not ACT's college and career readiness benchmarks. So if you go to the Illinois report card, they're actually reporting 41% meeting college and career readiness, but they're using a number of 21 instead of the actual ACT benchmarks. Only 28% of the students tested nationally met all four. 31% of the students in this country did not hit a single benchmark. And all they have to do is miss it by one score. So instead of a 22, if they got a 21, they don't get credit. We didn't have the ability to find the data, but I would be willing to bet that 31, they got the zero, came from the states that mandated the test for all students. A significant portion of that. And this is exhibit F on the If we look at attainment by ethnicity, now this data says three or more benchmarks. National benchmark attainment also varies by ethnicity. White students is in the yellow, so the second line, 50 in its flat line, about 50% of white students will hit three or more benchmarks, about 25% of Hispanics, that's kind of this hot pink here, and about 10% of African Americans will hit three or more benchmarks, and this is national data. This is an example of how, again, the trends pretty much stay consistent year to year. So if we look at student readiness through the EPAS system, and we're just going to focus on these three major areas. Here is your benchmark for the subjects. ACT expects one score point growth between Explore and Plan, three uh, score points growth of, um, in math from Plan to ACT, four in reading, and three for science to end up with a 22 and a 23 respectively. So again, kids need to come into high school hitting these benchmarks in order to hit the ACT when they're a junior. If you have to be on track and it doesn't account for low socioeconomic yeah. they're assuming that all systems are right. And that also that they're in the core curriculum yet. Yeah. Correct. So what does this look like for District 228? Based upon the students that tested in 2015, so Ms. Campworth, you asked, uh, you talked about last week, are our, is our achievement going up? And actually it is. Compared to last year's class, we are up 1% in reading. We are up 2% in science. Math, we are the same. 25% of our students met the benchmarks in math. Again, 27% in reading and 23% in science. So we are making gains. And we're celebrating two different groups of students. So let's always remember that. Absolutely. <clears throat> We've been putting a significant emphasis, emphasis on critical thinking skills and reading. The science growth, we have to kind of take into context where we've been with our curriculum. This group of students was the first class to actually go through the physics first. All students took physics, chemistry, and biology. There were no remedial classes. There was no low level. All kids took the core. This was the first class that actually got tested under that system. And we had 2% growth. I'm sorry. Um, schools with similar demographics, so they have the same um, low socioeconomic status. Close to the same demographic, you will find, and you can actually go on the Illinois Interactive Report Card and do some comparisons. If you try to plug in the exact demographics of our district, you will have nothing. Because there is no district like District 228. So you kind of have to um, play with some of the variables to get as close to our district as possible. So schools that are similar in our demographics, these are their score ranges, anywhere from 14% to 25%, meaning college and career readiness and reading, 8 to 22% in math, 7 to 18% um, in science. So the school districts that I looked at were District 227, the Rich Township, Bloom Township, Thornton, District 218, and Proviso are close to school demographics. When we include the surrounding schools, this is including District 230 and District 210, which is Lincoln Lane. So we're looking at now, they do not have the same demographics as District 228, but they are surrounding us. Um, and that's where you can see you um, have 54% 
achievement in reading, 56 in math, and 49% in science. Different demographics.
schools. We really put a, a significant emphasis on making sure that all kids are exposed to the core assignment. <coughs> this is our average growth. And then class average. is grade point average. This is reported by the Assistant Principals for Student Services at the conclusion of a semester. We look at it by building and we also look at it by ethnicity. So if you look at GPA and college readiness, the percentage of students meeting ACT college readiness benchmarks vary substantially by quartile of class rank. Just over 50% of the 2014 graduates ranked in the top 25% of the class and met all four benchmarks. And this is Exhibit N <coughs> in your binder. So students in the top 25% of the class, half of them met in college and career readiness benchmarks, all four. So this is an area of focus that we're just starting to look at again. We want to start, instead of taking a figure in isolation, let's look at multiple variables and see what this is telling us. We're starting to look at ECAS scores compared to grade point averages and where our students are headed. If we take a look at, these are our 2015 graduates, the ones that are going on to four-year colleges, they came into District 228 with an average explore score. Now this is all tests combined together. Their average explore score was a 17.2. They earned a 21.6 on their ACT, and their GPA was a 3.09. Students going on to two-year colleges came in at a 15, got a 19 on the ACT, which is a pretty decent ACT score, a lot of opportunities for those students. Their GPA was a 2.76 and onwards. But the 19.2 doesn't need a benchmark. No, 19.2 does not need a benchmark. But in our in our mind that students going to a two two year college with a 19.2 has a chance. Here we're looking at unweighted GPA. So one of the things we want to peel away is the weighted system. Students get a bump if they take AP, they take honors, they get a bump in their GPA. We just want to peel that back and look at all students on an equal playing field. And you'll see consistently year to year, so this is three years of data, our overall GPA as a district is about 2.64. And you have to remember that the students are taking a much more rigorous curriculum yes. while they're maintaining the GPA. So we're pushing them harder and they're achieving uh, similarly. Our second semester GPA on average is about a 2.5. <coughs> and what this, we have to also remember, they start putting all these pieces together, GPA is attributed to grades. So if we have students with high failure rates, what happens to their GPA? it starts to go down. So this is another indicator we want to watch for, is when we, if we start seeing a slippage in our GPA, let's, let's take a look at our failure rate and vice versa, because those have a direct impact on each other. The more students fail, the less likely they're to graduate on time. So that's another indicator that we want to throw into the mix. And that's something we'll show you in a, in a second. The state is start measuring how many students are on track to graduate in four years, in five years. It's about persistence. Here's our GPA by ethnicity. For our black students, on average, about a 2.3 for the first semester. And this is different wide. Second semester, about a 2.2. Hispanic students, 2.6. First semester, 2.5 on average. Second semester, our white students. On average, I would say about 2.75, we take 2.6 and 2.9. First semester, second semester, about 2.8. Now you have to, again, look at some data points. So we've got this outlier, you know, the number of students drives the GPA. You know, we have two white students at Hillcrest, 4.0. So, um, so you have to keep that in mind as you're looking at your data, the number of students that make up that. Failure data is reported by the Assistant Principals for Student Services. We look at failure uh, by semester and also by grade level. Overall, 
And this is something we have really significantly attacked over uh, the last several years by implementing the Freshman Learning Center. And because we had success with the Freshman Learning Center, we implemented Upper Class Learning Center. And you'll see we've had a significant decrease in failure rate since we started implementing these interventions. And again, when students are on track at their freshman year and finding success, they're more likely to graduate on time. They're also more likely to stay in the core curriculum. So we're not going to adjust that based on their failure rate. Same thing, second semester, we see a decrease. Again, we're not, we might be coming around the point where it's starting to level off. Will we ever be at a point where there'll be no failures? No, I don't think that's realistic, but trying to minimize the amount of failures that we have is really important. I think the important thing to realize with this, this value data, this is the number of courses still. So it's not the number of students. There could be a student who finds himself or herself in a crisis situation that fails five or six courses because of extenuating circumstances. That goes in here as six. It's one student failing six. Correct. I think that's a good point. So it's the number of E's, not the number of students. If we look at our failure by class, and here you have um, the left side of the black line is first semester and the right side is second semester. Blue, if we take a look at the blue, is just the district data. Um, then you can see it by building. Again, we're on a decline second semester. You know, something you always want to be aware of blips in the data, but not necessarily overreact at this point because, again, there's something in this particular class that we want to kind of dissect a little bit more. Why were there a little more failures this year as opposed to last year? We don't necessarily want to say we have an issue, but it's something that we want to look at. And this is also um, looked at by department, by building, by teacher. So if there's a unique uh, subject that's causing failure or a teacher that's causing failure, those are all addressed individually. 10th grade failures, again, if you look at the blue, we're seeing a nice decrease in our failure rate. 11th grade, you know, junior year is the most difficult year in high school. So we tend to see a little more failure rate, but again, we're on a downward, uh, downward trend. <coughs> see here again, a couple of lifts here and there, but most they're ready to get out. They just, let me buckle down, do what I need to do because I want to graduate. We look at demographic data, now we pull it out by ethnicity. We're seeing downward trends also in our ethnic groups. Failure rate for our black students is going down. Hispanic students, this might again be an area we want to take a look at and isolate. Do we have some issues? Is it our English art language learner students? Is it something else? We also are pushing our students into higher level classes, not just Hispanics, but also black students. So again, our failure rates because we're pushing, do we need to provide some additional interventions? The, with the Hispanics and the other thing you have to consider, they may not reach the level for eligibility of ELL, but they just might be a step or two above it, which causes some concern. And for our white students, we're also seeing a decline in failure rate. Freshman on track, this is a new indicator that the state is measuring. They started to measure it last year. This is reported through the student information system. They're looking at the total number of students on track and off track. First, let's define it. A student that is on track has earned at least five full year course credits or <coughs> 10 semester credits. But it's not just any 10. They have to have earned no more than one semester E in a core class. They're allowed one semester in a core class that they fail. If they fail the second semester, they're no longer on track. Course credits from summer school is not included in this data. And freshman on track is a key predictor of high school success. Students who finish the ninth grade on track are four times as likely to graduate from high school, they're not going to be a dropout, as students who are not on track. Research also shows that the number of students on track and the graduation rate rise when we actively intervene. So the more we continue to look at our data and provide supports through our learning centers and additional tutoring centers, 
the more our students are going to stay on track to graduate in four and or five years. This is reported on the Illinois report card. So again, we don't want to necessarily cause an alarm at this point. We do have an increase in the number of students that are not on track to graduate. Is this a trend that we're seeing on the uphill? We don't know. We don't have enough data to say that we have a trend. We have two data points. So we have to be careful when we're looking at, at these pieces. So this is uh, total students by building. These are the total students that are on track. Again, meaning they've had no more than one semester E in a core class. The number of students off track. And the percentage on track to graduate by building. This doesn't mean that they won't graduate in four years or five years, but we want to take a look at who are these students that are not on track and what can we do about it to get them back on track. Can you go back? I sure can. This is either just numbers, not percentages. Thank you. And so this is our district data. When we put all the pieces together, our total number of students the total number of students on track, off track, we have about 82% of the students on track to graduate. So the question for us at our building level, at our district level is, let's take a look at the students that aren't on track and what do we need to do differently. Next indicator that is reported on the state report card is graduation rates. This is reported by the Assistant Principals for Teaching and Learning. These are our, enroll, our graduation rates going back to 2007 and 2008. Remember, there was a target associated with graduation rates in terms of making a adequate yearly progress, and you'll see the targets listed below. From 2009-10 to 2010-11, the state changed how it reported its graduation rates. That's why you're going to see this significant decrease. So now it's based on so two things happened. Here they recalculated how student graduation rates uh, occur. Prior to that, you only looked at the senior year, how many students started the senior year, how many students graduated. Starting in 2010-11, they said no, look at how many students started as a freshman and then graduated with you. Okay, so that was what caused the decrease here. Starting in 2012 and 2013, they started reporting, well, how many students graduated in four years? and how many students graduated in five years. So they're adding another layer to this report. So here are graduation rates by building. When you see, especially at Hillcrest, we have, so again, if you just take that piece in isolation, you're probably wondering, wow, we only have 70% of our students graduate. But also remember, Hillcrest has a higher mobility rate. A lot of students coming in and out of Hillcrest. So part of the, the difficulty with this is if a student leaves, and this is not just for Hillcrest, this is for all of our schools. If a student leaves the district and we don't know where they end up, if they don't transfer to another school and that school doesn't pick it up or the student just drops out of high school, it counts against us. So if we don't follow through and figure out where all of these mobile students end up, it still counts against us. And in the state of Illinois, that's easy because there's a, a state reporting system, but if they go to another state, we lose complete track of that. Advanced placement. Another indicator that we've been looking at reported by the assistant principals for teaching and learning on a yearly basis. Scores come out in July and August. Let's talk about a little bit on the research. Participation in AP and subsequent success, so how well students do on the AP exam, is positively related to future college success, including better preparation for college rigor, and also an increased likelihood of graduating from college in fewer terms. National participation rate on the AP exam has increased in the last 10 years. More and more students are participating in AP. There are actually 30 AP exams offered by the College Board. They've also seen a 7.9% increase in the number of graduating seniors that are successful on one or more exams. And that goes back to our overarching understanding 
that we agree all students can learn and we want to provide all students with opportunities. Opening up the enrollment in AP classes regardless of grades. You know, in the past it used to be this lengthy application process to get into AP class and you had to have at least a C or better as opposed to I really enjoy art or I really enjoy science. I want to go take an AP class. Do it. Absolutely. Students with higher AP exam scores show higher first year and final subject specific GPA and fewer credit hours taken for a bachelor's degree than any non-AP student or dual enrolled student. And this is in Exhibit O, College Completion Comparing AP Dual Enrolled and Non-Advanced Students. We have always been of the mindset, first and foremost, exposure. I don't care if you take the AP exam or not, being in an AP class will set you up for future rigor and future understanding of what a college course is like. Secondary, yes, we want to build your confidence and your skill set to take the AP exam. But first and foremost, if a student is exposed to the AP class, they have a higher likelihood of enrolling in post-secondary institutions and finishing, as opposed to not enrolling in an AP course. I compare this a lot to back in our coaching days. We used to always want to coach faster. The faster you coach, the faster your players played and competed. Uh, translate the same thing into the classroom. They're going as fast as the class allows them to go. They don't realize that they're not prepared for it or all those other factors like test scores that separate. They're going as fast as the teachers want them to go, and, and it's proven to work. And so recognizing that push and support that we want to provide, we instituted AP camps, I want to say at least three years ago. Um, we'll be coming on our fourth year this summer uh, how do we help our eighth graders kind of transition to this AP experience and getting them comfortable with the rigor um, and that exposure before class even starts and kind of building up their confidence and listening to upperclassmen talk about, hey, I wish I knew this when I started AP or this is what AP has done for me. You heard it last week at the board meeting from Bremen students. The opportunity, the experience was outweighed anything. Um, even including their, their final grade. And there is a definite confidence factor in a student who does well in the course, or Absolutely. is simply in the course. In uh, District 228, the last school year, we actually added four new courses and <clears throat> AP exams. We added AP Microeconomics, AP US Government, AP Physics 1, which is, uh, they broke AP Physics B into two exams. It's Physics 1 and Physics 2. And AP American Literature, Language, and Composition, which is the junior level course. Those four courses alone contributed 462 new tests to our data pool. So that, that has significant impact. Um, and that's why when we look at the data points, I'm, and you'll see I'm not upset at our passing rate, knowing we had four new tests. So what does that mean? That means I've got four new teachers that have never taught the curriculum before and don't necessarily know the history of the test and that's something that takes time the more we keep our AP students or AP teachers in place the more confidence they gain in their curriculum the more understanding they have of the exam and the ins and outs hey this question is always on the AP exam let's focus on it or you know don't spend too much time over there they don't ask very many questions that comes with experience and with practice and also collaboration that's something we're really working on in the district is in most cases, for example, in AP Physics 1, there's only one teacher in a building that teaches that class. Well, let's get them together with the other teachers in the other three buildings to help support each other as they're delivering that curriculum and getting that experience. In terms of enrollment over the last six years, in 2009-2010, district-wide, we only had 722 students enrolled in AP classes. Now, this also means one student could be in five AP classes. So this is just enrollment. Last year, we had over 2,400 students taking AP classes. We've made a significant commitment to this. We've made a significant commitment also to building AP programs in each of our high schools. If we remember in Bill, how long ago was that? Maybe even 2012, 2013. Hillcrest students had to travel to the other three buildings because we didn't have AP programs 
at the level that we had in the other three. We've made a significant commitment, not just at Hillcrest, but to keep kids in their home school and building the AP programs there. Okay, so that's why you're going you're gonna, to continue to see an increase in the number of students at Hillcrest participating in AP programs. In terms of the total test taken, so let's go back. We had 2,453 enrollees. 1,808 tests were taken by those students. Clarify the rules. Those are not different students. No. Um, it could be one student taking six tests. Right. So 50% <coughs> of our students are AP students. I don't want to do this. Right, right. These are the number of actual bodies in all the different classes. They could be repeats. So, 75% of the enrollees actually took tests. Well, why isn't that 100%? Again, we leave the choice of test taking up to the student. In some cases, the student has declared already up front, I just want the exposure, I don't want to take the test right now. I'm not confident, I, this is not my area of expertise, but I just want to be in this class to get that rigor. Sometimes partway through the curriculum, they realize, you know what, I'm not necessarily prepared for this test. I don't want to take the test. They don't have to. So part of this is choice. Okay. So that's why we have 75% of the students taking the test. Of the 1,808 tests taken, they were taken by 986 students. So these are actual bodies. 986 of our students took 1,808 tests. And that's up from, in 2008-2009, we only had about 260 students take a test one or more tests. Of those 986 students, they passed 761 exams. And that equates to a 42% pass rate. Now again, I'm not, I'm not upset, disappointed. We have to consider the number of students. We had only 258 students take tests and they, were, they had a 47% pass rate. We had 900 students take tests and we had a 42% pass rate. We definitely have room for growth. Remember, a lot of our AP courses are new. Teachers are just starting to gain awareness and understanding of how the AP program works. We want to continue. Um, we require all of our AP teachers to participate in training every year to make sure that they stay current. I will also tell you many of the college board tests have changed. Um, history went through some significant changes. So as the test changes and becomes different, teachers have to adapt. They don't know necessarily the tricks and the ins and outs. Um, the same thing just happened this year with biology. So our biology pass rate went down. Um, and again, new tests, scores are going to be different. There, there's also a political struggle when it comes to AP. If you're a, a college or a university, the more students come in with uh, college credit, the less opportunities for tuition. So you, you hear in the news colleges advocating for raising the standards, which benefits them. In Illinois, I believe that Governor Rounder has just <coughs> passed it in a three or more in an Illinois state school will count. So he took our local students out of um, that with the public schools, not with the, the privates. That's always a political struggle you'll hear about. Yeah, but that's a significant saving, again, going back to our percentage of low-income students going up, and this is just opportunities for them to be exposed to college and not necessarily carry that financial burden. And in first generation, uh, there's research that says first generation uh, college students have higher hurdles to get over. So if we can lower those hurdles in high school, we put them on a, a good course for being okay when they leave. So the presentation that Dr. Kabelk has made last week, this is what this means in terms of all of our district students. So we had 96 AP scholars coming out of last year's excuse me, group. That means they got a three or more on three or more exams. We had uh, 16 students with the AP scholar with distinction. They had an average of 3.25 on four or more exams. We had 33 AP scholars with distinction. They got a 3.5 on five or more exams. And we had five national scholars, which means they got a four on eight or more AP exams, which is phenomenal. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is kids will actually float in between these scholars. So the more AP tests they take, they have the opportunity to jump to the next um, distinction level. So these are not static numbers. 
In terms of our demographics, we're seeing an increase in participation from our minority students. Back in 2010, we only had 36 black students in the entire district participate in an AP exam. This year, we had 284, and we're continuing to see an increase in our testers. Again, as we build confidence in our AP students and our AP program, we'll see more and more success. Same thing with our Hispanic. We had 46 students back in 2010. We had 300 this year take test. Our white students, we also see an increase, 365 in 2010 to uh, 970 students last year. If we look at our pass rate, again, we have some work as we open. You know, we don't want to be discouraged by the, the low pass rate. We're opening up opportunities. We're exposing students to new courses. We expect that pass rate to increase. And that's percentage. Absolutely, this is a percent, percent pass rate, not the number. We have a 35% pass rate in our Hispanic students, 52% with our white students. Next uh, multiple measure is College and Career Center. This is reported by the Assistant Principals for Student Services. So where are our students heading after they leave us? We did a senior exit survey in about May, April and May of their senior year, where they're giving us an indication of, of where they're going. And this is our trend. We started collecting this data in 2011. We have about 66% of our students going off to four-year colleges or universities. Sorry, that was back in 2011. In 2015, 56% of our students are going off to four-year universities. Again, this could be because of financial issues. It's not saying that they're not prepared, but some students may want to go to a two-year first before they go on to four-year school. Meanwhile, the other piece of that, um, we've made a, a real focused effort to um, advertise the opportunities for our students at South Suburban College with the two years of free tuition or those opportunities so that that may look bad but it may be opportunities that uh, are better for our students. 27% of our students are attending two-year colleges or universities. 4% are enlisting in the military. 3% in trade schools. And then we have 7% um, split between workforce and undecided. I think it's about 8 in the I did, I'm sorry, blue. 8% uh, of the students are, even though it's not combined workforce and undecided, 8% um, going into the workforce, about 1 to 2% um, are undecided. We asked uh, students a question, does your high school give you adequate direction in preparing for your future? This is something, again, uh, the APs for Student Services take this feedback and, and look at, well, how can we improve what we're doing with our students? Uh, 50, sorry, 57% of the students district-wide feel that they're prepared to <coughs> have an adequate direction for their future. If we look at um, students from 2014, 31% of the graduates of 2014 did not meet a single benchmark. We had 25% of them enrolled in four-year institutions and 44% enrolled in four-year. Now, this is national data. So even though they didn't hit the benchmark, almost 70% of those students went on to college anyway. If we look at our own students, only 13% of our graduates met the college readiness benchmarks in 2015. Yet 79% of our students are going on to post-secondary opportunities. So again, we have to look at probability of success, not whether or not they met a benchmark. I'm going to skip to a fast forward. We're going to fast forward the learning data really quick. You have in your packet, <coughs> and at your leisure, you can look through trend data in terms of attendance suspensions, referrals, and missed infractions. If you would fast forward to where you see academic interventions. Almost worth it.
first slide is pretty <coughs> overwhelming, but this is, in essence, we boiled everything down to three major pieces. The first one at the top here is the performance evaluation plan. This is looking at improving teaching and learning, and it's made up of two pieces. We have the Danielson side on the left, which we have spent four years putting together, and in, we implemented it two years ago. This is the professional practice side of teacher evaluation. This year, we're on the right side where we're actually implementing student growth. We spent the entire last school year, we had 180 days to negotiate a student growth model. Uh, it was a team of 50% JFA uh, teacher representatives and 50% administration. We actually negotiated within 177 days um, the student growth model, so we met our target, and we're actually implementing that model this year. It is 30% of the teacher's evaluation, and it's based on two types of data. The first one, which is one of our goals this year, is common assessment. It's, a, it's called a type two assessment, and this is an assessment that, that is given to, it's the same assessment that's given to all students in a given course. There's a second data type, which is on the right, which is called a type three, and this is a, a, um, an assessment that's created by the teacher, and that covers content skills. The type one, the type two assessment on the left is actually covering reading. We ensure one thing that we're focusing right now is we're going through the student growth model is that these assessments have to be aligned to standards, and they also have to reflect a range of rigor, which means we're moving away from tests that just ask factual recall and understanding, and we're moving into higher order thinking questions that students are need to um, be exposed to, like on the ACT and also PARC. These are analysis questions, these are evaluation questions. We're moving into higher level assessment questions, and teachers' evaluation is going to be held accountable to that higher standard. And our teachers are, are very new at it, so yes. they're, you can expect to struggle, you can expect to stress. The goal, though, is, is to take data from those assessments, not only the reading assessment, but also the content skills being assessed, and start to drive differentiated instruction, which is another area of focus. We want to analyze data and look for opportunities to increase student achievement by individual students, by groups of students. And we focus on differentiated instruction in multiple areas. We want to make sure that lesson plans are aligned to standards, not that they aren't, but again, we want to make sure that they are specifically aligned to standards, that the lessons that the students are engaged with on a daily, weekly, monthly basis reflect the range of rigor. We should be doing lots of worksheets all the time. We should be engaging and actively using the, the knowledge. Resources should be differentiated for students. If I have a population in my classroom that are English language learners, I have to supplement what I give students with more visuals, with more vocabulary opportunities, because not only are they learning the language of the subject, they're learning English on top of it. So we have to support those students. Am I using formative assessments, meaning am I checking in with my students more frequently to see who's with me, who's not with me, and what am I doing about it? And again, actively engaging students. They shouldn't be sitting passive listening to me lecture. They need to be engaging with the material. So all of these things are woven through the three major domains of Danielson. Domain one, which is planning for my instruction. And my planning, understanding the students in my class, understanding what the data is telling me and how I'm adjusting. Am I creating an environment for my diverse learners? And am I instructing my diverse learners, which is domain three? If I do all of these things, if I'm looking at data, I'm differentiating from my students, this will have a, have a positive impact on Danielson, and we will start moving teachers to the right. And we always talk about moving them to the right. We want our teaching staff to be solidly proficient and moving towards excellence in components of where they are strong. Again, it's, it's not a place, and Danielson will actually say this, it's not a place that we hang out, we visit, because our students change year to year. Our curriculum and our teaching practices need to adjust with the students in front of us. So if I don't recognize I have a significantly higher population of low-income students and I don't figure out what they already know and supplement and give them uh, opportunities to fill in some gaps, if you will, because they don't have the same experiences, I'm going to be missing opportunities for growth. If you were trained and taught prior to 2001, there was actually 
no data in your professional development. So you've been teaching for quite a number of years and you're obligated to a model like this. This is a huge philosophical change. Um, guaranteeing that all diverse learners have success in your classes, that in itself is an incredible mind shift. So you can understand the stress that this puts uh, veteran teachers on them. This particular area right here, this uh, common assessment, this type two assessment, this is actually our worthy target that we're focusing on for district improvement. And uh, this worthy target is related to discipline literacy. Why are we focusing on this? Discipline literacy is the use of reasoning, reading, investigating, speaking, and writing that's required in a content area. We spent a long time, uh, two years ago, looking at how do we improve reading. We went to several schools and, and visited different programs. Some schools had a standalone reading program. Some schools required all freshmen to take a reading program. And what we found, there's no right or wrong, but what we found is those standalone programs put the responsibility of reading on that person, on that program, on that teacher, as opposed to reading is everyone's responsibility. Every subject has a different approach to reading, whether your music, students have to be able to read music and that requires a certain skill level. Whether you're going into science, approaching a science article is completely different than reading a piece of uh, fiction or reading a piece of prose in English. And there's different skill sets that our students need to learn to be able to navigate all these different areas. That's why it's important, it's everyone's responsibility to teach those skills in their content area. So we're focusing on three of the common core standards. There's ten. We've narrowed it down to three. The first one is citing key details. What's the main idea? What can you infer? Standard seven is being able to evaluate diverse media. When you're watching a news clip, are you able to pull out some facts? And let's compare that to what we just read in the textbook. Does it agree? Does it disagree? Let's look at this data table and compare that to this map. What trends are we seeing? So it's being able to manipulate different pieces of multimedia and making sense of it. And then the last one is evaluating an argument. Taking the claims, taking what you know, and can you evaluate an argument? Can you make an argument? So those are the three um, key areas of focus. For the entire district. English is going to pick up those other top four reading standards, the other, the remaining seven. Right. English and social studies. Social studies. The bulk of their curriculum revolves around the ten common core reading standards. These three standards are also directly aligned to PARC, so I'll talk about that. So why is this important? For students, it helps them become engaged critical thinkers. It's no longer can you regurgitate to me a list of facts. Can you actually take those facts and apply <clears throat> them is what we're aiming for. This also emulates what does an expert do in the field. As a scientist, I have to read multiple types of research articles, prepare my own research, and be able to articulate that in a way that's also like everyone else. Am I supporting my evidence? Am I refuting somebody else's piece of work? A historian, you're trying to make sense of what happened in history. And that takes a very uh, significant skill set. This also helps expand vocabularies. So going back to if I understand where my students are, especially if they're English language learners or they're low income, I can use reading as a way to fill in some gaps. Rather than me lecturing to you all this information, here's an article, let's read it, let's talk, I want you to pull out three key details. If you're building some foundation knowledge and letting the student do that building rather than me telling you what you don't know. For teachers, this helps to create independent learners. Putting the control of learning, you already, we already know this information, it's up to the student now to grapple with it. Allow students to demonstrate their knowledge at a deeper level, and this simulates what college is like. We all remember we went you know, to classes, we were given a big book, you had to read five chapters and let's come back and talk about it, if you talked about it at all, but then you got to test on it two weeks later. Students have to be able to make sense of what they're reading. <clears throat> and this will simulate that. For us, these three standards are directly aligned to PARC. The way the PARC test is structured, it's broken into steps. In the first few uh, sections of the test, the students have to 